Now that you've kind of seen a couple um, a couple different examples of games or gotten to play with a couple, I just want to go through a couple things that I think about. Um, I use games like primarily in the clinical setting. So I'm working in kind of like um, chaos where my students are getting paged, where my um, my residents who are my students and my medical students and uh, maybe the code bell goes off and it's a sort of busy pediatric um, ward setting is primarily where I use games for teaching. So I just wanna like drop a couple things from the literature and just a couple experiential thoughts about how I think games can be used effectively in those kind of settings. Um, one article that I just absolutely love was a randomized study where they randomized to instruction by active techniques compared to instruction by traditional lecture and found that students rated the um, traditional instruction like a very eloquent presenter, you could imagine, would get very high marks for their teaching. But the, the retention of knowledge and the transfer of information to the students was lower compared to active techniques. So it's one thing I think about is like if our students are going to be reviewing us after we teach them and we know active techniques are going to get us lower reviews, that's something we should be aware of. And kind of on the, the, the authors of this article said we should address like kind of that up front and say, hey, we're going to teach with a game and that might not feel exactly like instruction, but this game is designed to teach you X and make sure we're being very intentional about like framing it in a good way. Um, I also kind of like thinking about it in like a self-determination theory kind of framework or like what are the things that we can do, like what are those theories that we can think about when we're playing games with students that we engage them and use them in an, an effective way. So like um, autonomy is one of those things that that an adult or any human wants to have. So games, I think Eric said this up front at some point, some people would say if you're making someone do something, and you're forcing them to do it, it actually does not meet some some like scholarly definitions of a game. So I often do take games as a voluntary situation. I say, hey, today we're gonna learn antibiotics. Should we do the whiteboard cephalosporin talk? Or should we go to the patient's bedside and talk through their antibiotics? Or should we play a game? And lots of times people will opt to play that game, but I think like consenting them in sort of to the participate in the game of their education, I think is really um, a good way to go. There's also, depending on the style of game you use, there are some games where you can, in, in more robust sort of game settings where there's more than one strategy to win, that that kind of feeds into that autonomy. Like, oh, look at me, I did the, I did the crazy cephalosporin route and I only played beta lactams the whole time and I still won. Wasn't that neat how I did that, right? Like, are there other ways to, are there other ways to play besides like sort of a, a railroaded sort of design? competence. This is probably getting back to some of proximal development to some degree. All these things sort of tie together in different ways. Um, but, you know, making sure you're not making a game that's too hard for your students or not setting them up for failure, having something that's in within, within reach for them. Also in those ways is objective feedback. Like someone might not make the right choice in the game or maybe not the optimal choice in the game, but it's good to go back and say, hey, that was cool how you picked this. I wonder if you were thinking about you know, how, how these two concepts connect in a certain way um, and be, you know, give specific objective feedback as you go to show them what they do know. Um, and finally is like relatedness, like we're people and we like to connect with other people and games is like a great way to do that. And games are just naturally sort of a way to do that. Um, one of the other things I, I modified these from a, um, a JGME piece about um, the social determination theory or self-determination theory, but um, you know, just addressing people by name, learning their names is a really good general strategy. And I apply that when I do gamified teaching or any other sort of, you know, interaction with humans. So like framing this out, like on in a given day, I'll say like, Hey, this is what we're going to do. These are the options. Well, we, we're going to play this game, but I want you to, to come back with one learning point at the end. So you can kind of plan to save one, at least one piece of memory in your head and reiterate that back to me. I set a timer because I'm working in chaos. I say, Hey, this is 15 minutes. We're going to play as much as, as 15 minutes can allow. And then we're going to stop wherever we are. I have some that are shorter, right? If anyone that was in that breakout room saw that that sorting game was like three minutes. Um, and then finally, at the end, you want to share your learning points or, or depending on the complexity of the game debrief. Because when we, we make games that abstract things, there's the possibility that we're going to um, simplify complicated systems in a way that leads to people misunderstanding how things really work. And Teresa's got a nice article about that. Um, debrief and have people reiterate what they learned from the game and make sure that that is what you intended to teach. Because you, when, you're, when you're using a game, you're potentially setting people up to learn something different than what you intended. You're not just listing words, right? So that, those are some, some tips that I have for teaching. And feel free to jump in if you have questions or clarifications on any of that. 
I think Jane McGonigal, she's a big um, person in kind of the gamification uh, literature as well. And she talks about that consent part is actually really important because when someone's making you do something, it's definitely not, it's not going to be fun. Not that serious games have to have be fun, but it's also not respectful and all those other things. And um, people won't learn when they're being coerced, basically. We've tried in medical education for a long time and we know that it doesn't oh, work. About 120 so. years, yeah. Exactly. So uh, I think it's about time we started changing things. Yeah. All right. Um, and then Tom's going to take over with some tips about going from using games and seeing our games to how to, you could design games on your own and some some tips from that regard. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so there's been a, a lot of, I think, super convincing information about the utility of using games to try to get your point across or to, to share some challenging feature of your of your profession. and I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the, the overarching principles when you're making your next game. I think one of the key things is to start with the idea of you want to align the incentives. What that means is that the game mechanics need to really align with the educational goals that you've decided on, uh, which means that winning in the game should promote the behavior that you're looking for. And the way that you create those rules and define the, the gameplay is going to be dependent on the category of uh, behavior you're promoting. So um, I think, for example, things like uh, gridlocked is a great example of how you might use a, a game utility to emulate how systems function or interact. Um, so you're kind of abstracting away uh, some of the less productive parts of that activity. And it's a great place to also introduce things like humor and fun. Like this is where the actual enjoyment of the game comes in. It's when you can pull out the stuff that's dull or time consuming and really focus on the learning points that are actually entertaining. Um, when you're trying to modify behavior, I think some of the level X products are amazing when with actually manipulating how people are, are using tools. But it can be other simple things too, like the teaching techniques from clinical coaching cards um, and, and uh, gauging the acuity and uh, gestalt. For tasks that are a little bit more simple, like just trying to learn or retain facts, it, it doesn't mean that there isn't an opportunity to include a game. The, the game mechanics here would include support for the learner recalling the facts of interest and can give you an opportunity to do things like spaced repetition without being um, really overt about it. The first step once you've decided that you want to create a game is to uh, create the MVP, so your minimum viable product. And the idea here is that you don't wanna spend a whole lot of time creating something that you think will work and then see someone use it for the first time and realize that that is absolutely not what you pictured was going to happen. The easiest way to get your MVP off the ground is uh, just doing it on low fidelity tools like paper. So print out your, your board, uh, just write out your cards and watch someone using it in the way that you thought and start gathering that feedback immediately. The benefit there is that you can get immediate information about how someone is practically gonna use your new game and iteration is much easier. So it's, it's a lot faster to change a simple thing on a note card that you wrote out than trying to go through the application that you made or the app that you designed and try to change things at that point. Focus groups are another really good way to get a lot of feedback quickly. So um, you can observe people playing your game. You can just have them play the game and return to you with feedback. And sometimes you being present can help a lot more too. Another really important thing when you're creating your gameplay mechanics is to try to keep it as simple as possible. The idea here is that you don't want the tasks related to managing the game to intrude upon the experience itself. Um, the picture on the right is a, a, like a tracking sheet for some Dungeons and Dragons game. And there's a lot of information there. It doesn't mean that it's not fun, but your audience may not be as interested in that as you are. And so remember that gamification should enhance the experience. If, if there's a lot of extra work related to it, that's just gonna detract from it. For basic principles, the preparatory work should be minimal 
it should be pretty easy to just do a test round and get enough of the game mechanics to not have to sit there reading a lengthy manual and try to minimize the number of available actions that the user can take because that's when it starts to get confusing if there are 15 options at each move that's going to be um that's going to put you on that confused and stressed side and you want to keep it to like one or two things and then incorporate advanced elements as they start to gain experience with the tool so remember as well that you're making this because you want it to be a better experience and importantly whatever tools that you decide to use come with their own um, advantages and you should try to leverage your medium as best as possible so if for example you've created a card based game the interaction there is pretty simple flipping to get more information trading between users for a board game there's a lot of opportunities for randomness with a dice roll for example and branching so you can send send your learner on a different path either randomly or intentionally I think there's a lot of opportunities for leveraging electronic tools to enhance the user experience. So all of a sudden, if you create your interactive tool, you have an opportunity to share different kinds of media. So you can now include a video, for example, and then uh, some of the more tedious tasks like scoring can be automated. And then the last thing is that the, the incorporation of competition is where I think a lot of the engagement can come in and especially affirmative competition. So you want to award individual achievements. Um, you can also include things like a leaderboard so that people can compete without it having to be a overly personal thing. So if you have a leaderboard showing the top N number of players and you can try to independently work your way up, that can be a really engaging uh, thing for your users. Um, another feature is replay potential. So you want to make sure that your player is getting feedback and guidance to improve their performance because they're not going to come back and play if they have no indication of how to get better and they don't feel like they're getting instruction on what to do next. The other options for replay potential so that once you've created your game, you can start to add complications that will allow the game to, to progress naturally. And this takes away from some of the interest early on in keeping it simple. So start with a level one of just a simple uh, game with limited options, and then you can expand on that by attaching complications here and there as uh, the learner progresses. Can I just add to that really quick, Tom? So when anybody gets new to a game, there's a phase where they have to learn the rules. Um, and then they start to get, so when Tom said you limit the choices up front, the reason why is because they have to learn the rules of the game before they learn the strategy of the game. So the best onboarding for any kind of game is where the game is the onboarding. So there should be steps within the game up front where you are learning the rules and then people start to learn strategies of the game. And that's when people start having a lot of fun because they know how to manipulate and how to, how to play the game and compete against others. Yeah, I would say that's kind of the one of the really important game mechanics for gridlocked. When you look at the wheel, um, that's a starter wheel. And um, someday we'll have an expansion pack where the wheel will be completely different because it'll come with a 20 sided die. And that's what my colleagues are currently texting me about because they had 17 received in the last hour. And so <laughs> the idea would be that like uh, in that game, uh, there's no onboarding time. You just got to be ready to roll. Um, but in our game, you start off with like, drawing two cards per turn because we want you to handle the two cards before you roll a die and get a 16. And if I'm playing with advanced learners, like our, like I played with emergency medicine fellows who are like doing a PEM fellowship after having trained for, you know, their core training. Oh, well, they got the, they got the 12 sided die like off the get go so that the, they, they onboarded for one turn, one turn. And then after that, cause they're supposed to have those strategies in their head, they rolled the 12, I mean, it was like raining patients and and so they had to handle it um and uh and and that's that's what we did on on that kind of more advanced learner version so similar to when we were talking in uh, the room that i had with polyus where you know like like when table rounds the cards are um they they can they're they could be simply connected or they could be really deep and you'd have to like name the lithium level that causes altered mental status. And so um, again, there's the, the levels of complexity can, can be built within because Tetris when you're playing and the, the pieces fall slowly down is a completely different game than Tetris when they're 
falling so fast you can't handle the pieces. And so um, having some mechanics to allow for you to upregulate or downregulate that difficulty is another way of adding some interest in playability. Thank <music> you.